Welcome, everybody. So um, we are going to be live on YouTube, so we're going to start on time. Um, I just want to welcome you as we come together tonight uh, through a story uh, of shared experience to celebrate the investiture tomorrow and seating next week of Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, the first African American woman to serve on the United States Supreme Court. Discovering our guest speaker for tonight was serendipitous and exciting. Last spring, as Katanji Brown Jackson exhaled calmly through her confirmation hearings, a team of volunteers here was preparing a grand opening of the DuPont Historical Museum's Buffalo Soldier History Exhibit. We researched, found, and invited a nearby fairly well-known Buffalo Soldier fan to be our speaker, but also discovered this amazing biography. Uh, biography. Kirsten Brunson is a retired Army officer who served over 23 years on active duty in the Judge Advocate General's Corps. Kirsten holds a BA in criminology from the University of Maryland, a Juris Doctorate from UCLA, and a Master of Laws degree from the Judge Advocate General's Legal Center and School. In 2008, she became the first African American woman to serve as a judge in the US Army. She has also been inducted into the Army Women's Foundation Hall of Fame and was recently appointed by the Secretary of Defense to serve on the Military Justice Review Panel. Though retired, <laughs> she continues to actively serve in many roles. She co-chairs the Veterans and Military Committee of the National Association of Women Judges and volunteers in many community organizations on JBLM and its nearby community. We are grateful and honored that she accepted our invitation to speak as we celebrate this historic first tonight. So join me in welcoming US Army Judge, retired Colonel Kirsten Brunson. Thank you. Um, it was really neat. Uh, first of all, just seeing the exhibit, the Buffalo, Buffalo Soldier exhibit, and um, then being cornered by a couple of women at that exhibit. Was, <laughs> that, was, that was pretty exciting too. So, okay. Um, normally, this is weird because my ladies are sitting back here and they know if I'm saying something wrong. So I'm just like trying not to look in that direction, but they know that I don't normally dress like this <laughs> and I move around a lot. So I have my notes and I'm gonna try to be very still and very professional, okay? Um, but if I wander, don't worry, I'll come back. I even wrote it and typed it in really big print so I wouldn't need the glasses, but I'm gonna wear them just in case. So um, I know Bridget and I talked about this at one of the first iterations of the flyer. So I hope those of you here were not expecting Katanji Brown Jackson. Um, I don't know if you saw Jordan Peele's movie, but nope. <laughs> just me, it's just me. <laughs> so, so why am I here? Why am I talking about our newest Supreme Court justice and what do we have in common? Justice Jackson, as we all know, is the first African-American woman to serve on our nation's highest court. And I was the first African-American woman, actually the first woman of color to serve as a judge in the active army. Since I became a judge in 2008, there have been more women of color donning the army robe. And I hope we'll be able to say that uh, sometime in the not too distant future, we'll have more African-American women following in Justice Jackson's steps. <clears throat> So what does it mean to be first, and why is it something to be celebrated? 
I often believe the opposite, that instead of a celebration, it's an exclamation, as in, she's the first, but it's the 21st century. Depending on your point of view, the first means that no one before her was qualified. Really? <laughs> We're not gonna go with that one. Or no one before her was given the opportunity. And that's why I say it isn't necessarily a celebration. Yes, we should celebrate Justice Jackson's ascension to the uh, highest court in the land. And I was one of the loudest celebrants. But when people seem to compliment me or celebrate me as being the first, my inner question is usually, but why was I? So who am I? You've heard some, I'm probably gonna repeat it, but so I don't lose my place, I'm just gonna go with it. Um, I am the second of four daughters born to Mitchell and Virginia Campbell who met at Florida A&M University. My father served on active duty as an army intelligence officer and then as an intelligence analyst for the Defense Intelligence Agency. And my mother was a public school English teacher and librarian. I am the product of a public school education. I started out attending a predominantly black elementary school before being bused in the second grade. In high school, I was involved in student government, debate, and I was captain of the cheerleading squad. <laughs> I attended Hofstra University on Long Island. You have to say it that way, otherwise they'll call you Southern. So, uh, but I attended Hofstra for two years before transferring back home to University of Maryland. I had been a cheerleader at Hofstra but I declined the invitation to be a Maryland Terps cheerleader because practice interfered with ROTC. I graduated from University of Maryland with a BA in criminology and a commission as a second lieutenant in the military police corps from Howard University's ROTC program. I also earned my parachutist badge, which means I jumped out of a perfectly good airplane more than once. I took what's called an educational delay and I attended law school at UCLA School of Law before going on active duty in the Army. <clears throat> While in law school, I was on the law review and I clerked for a federal district court judge. Upon joining the Army, I was stationed in Germany where I had hoped to get a BMW or at least a grandfather clock, but instead I found an infantry lieutenant who's sitting in the back of the room. <laughs> so I've been married to Xavier for almost 29 years and we have three children. Our girls, Rachel and Rebecca, are college graduates. Our son, Joshua, is an eighth grader at Harrison Prep and also a competitive gymnast. And we also have a Labradoodle, Nava, who thinks she's one of my children. I served almost 24 years on active duty <clears throat> in the Army in Germany, North Carolina, Texas, Kentucky, and the DC area. I've served as a legal assistance attorney, a prosecutor, a defense counsel, an appellate defense counsel, an administrative law attorney, and a claims attorney. I've worked with special operations forces and classified units. As you heard, I earned a master of laws in military law with a specialty in military justice. And I served as a military judge in Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. As I mentioned, I'm the product of a public school education. I believe we do have some educators in the room. One show of hands. All right, great. So I believe we probably also have some parents, some aunts and uncles, some brothers and sisters, some friends. I wanna to talk to all of you about making firsts and then ensuring that there are many more. I'm going to be a bit familiar and I'm going to refer to Justice Jackson as Katanji. First, because I really like that name. And second, it starts with a K just like mine. So for similarity. So what do Katanji and I have in common? Obviously we're both lawyers, but how did we even get there? Katanji was born in DC and raised in Miami. I was born in Miami and raised in the DC area, actually in Prince George's County, Maryland. Both her parents and mine graduated from an HBCU, a historically black college and university. And both of our mothers were DC public school teachers. So that's the formula for making a judge, right? <laughs> well, kind of. Because when your parent is an educator, education is important. And when your parents are college educated, college is important. And when your parents are black, these things sometimes take on a monumental significance. Do I need to explain why? 
just in case, we can all accept that education opens doors, yes? When your parents lived in the South during the 1950s and 60s, education was a way out of Jim Crow subjugation. <clears throat> so let me talk to the educators. When Katanji was in high school and she shared her dream of attending Harvard University, her guidance counselor told her not to set her sights so high. So many young black girls have had the same thing happen to them, including Michelle Obama. My guidance counselor was different. She said absolutely nothing. I researched and selected colleges completely on my own. I had no idea what an Ivy League school was, and so I didn't apply to any. All I knew was that I wanted to go to school in New York, so I looked for schools in New York. Remember, my parents' experience was attending an HBCU in their home state. They had no experience in choosing from the nation's vast array of colleges. So now I'm talking to guidance counselors, school administrators, and teachers. Please, please be an encourager. Find that young girl that has a dream and help it flourish. Find that young girl who doesn't know what's available to her and open her eyes. Find that young girl who never even thought college was an option and expand her horizons. You are already an influencer. Use that position to lift up, to cheer on, to lean in. As Plutarch wrote, the mind is not a vessel for filling, but wood that needs igniting. You can be the match that lights a young mind and helps her to fulfill her dreams. Or you can be that guidance counselor. You know, the one that told a future Supreme Court justice not to set her sights on Harvard. So how did we succeed without assistance from those who were supposed to provide it? Both Katanji and I were heavily influenced by, by our fathers. Her father started law school while she was in preschool and she sat coloring while he studied. He gave her the example of achievement against the odds. My father supported my choices and my dreams. Knowing that I wanted to attend UCLA School of Law, he was surprised when I told him I was going to University of Southern California. Again, chose the law school solely for the beaches. <laughs> I explained that USC had given me a full ride and UCLA had given me nothing. He told me if that is what I really wanted, UCLA, then that is what I should do and it'll all work out. And it did, but that's another story. The takeaway is that support from our parents and particularly from our fathers can be the wind that helps us soar, that final push across the finish line. And it doesn't have to be perfect. Katanji's parents are still married today. My parents separated when I was in elementary school, but my father still heavily influenced my life. So gentlemen, don't let divorce or distance or anything else be an excuse for not uplifting your daughters. And why do they need uplifting? The statistics for African-American women are very concerning. In 2019, African-American women made up 12.9% of the population of women in the United States. In that year, 11.4% of the bachelor's degrees earned by US citizen and permanent resident women were earned by African-American women. That sounds great, right? until you learn that the rate has continued to decrease since 2012. And while 12% of US households are headed by women, 27% of black households are headed by women. <clears throat> African-American women held only 4.4% of all management positions in the United States. Now, while women employed full-time year-round in this country are typically only paid 83 cents on the dollar for, ev for every dollar that men make, African-American women working full-time year-round are paid just 64 cents for every dollar paid to white non-Hispanic males. And in some states, it's as low as 48 cents per dollar. According to the Department of Labor, this remains true, even controlling for education. In other words, a black woman with the same educational credentials still only earns 65 to 75 cents for every dollar paid to a white man. In addition to not earning enough, African-American women experience significant inequities in health. They have a shorter life expectancy than white women and experience much higher mortality rates around pregnancy and birth. 
According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the pregnancy-related mortality rate for all women is 16.9%. For African-American women, 42.4%. The intersectionality of gender and race has negatively impacted African-American women's health, income, and overall quality of life. We are daily fighting an uphill battle with two strikes against us. So for a black girl to become an army judge or a Supreme Court justice, she has to make it through all of that. The lack of guidance or support from guidance counselors, the pennies on the dollar that she earns, the inadequate or insufficient health care she receives. But she does make it. Because she had parents that instilled in her a hunger for education and a belief that she could achieve because people around her supported her dream despite the naysayers and because of other examples that she saw around her. We're here for a reason. I believe a bit of the reason is to throw little torches out to lead people through the dark. Whoopi Goldberg said that. The fact that we're still having firsts means we still need those torches, that some people still need to be able to come in out of the dark but there have been lots of lights. So let's see what you know. We have come to the audience participation portion of our program. Who can tell me who was the first African-American woman to win an EGOT? That's an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony. In the back. Whoopi Goldberg, that is correct. Hold on. So I'm gonna toss it. <laughs> so Whoopi Goldberg uh, got her EGOT in 2002. She lit the way for Jennifer Hudson in 2022. She, Jennifer, Jennifer Hudson competed on American Idol and won an Oscar for her breakout performance in Dreamgirls and followed that with a Grammy, an Emmy, and a Tony, making her the youngest woman to ever earn an EGOT. All right, who can tell me who is Mae Jemison? Yes. Close, African-American, there you go. <laughs> yes, Mae Jemison, the first African-American woman uh, astronaut to go to space in 1992. And she lit the way for Stephanie Wilson, Joan Higginbotham, and most recently, Jessica Watkins, who launched to the International Space Station in April of this year, making her the first black woman to be part of a crew aboard the International Space Station. All right, this one's harder. Alice Coachman. Any sports fans? No guesses? All right. Alice was the first African-American woman to win an Olympic gold medal in 1948. She won the high jump after often being denied the opportunity to train. Ultimately, she was assisted by a high school boys track coach who saw in her something that nobody else did. She lit the way for Wilma Rudolph to win gold in track in 1960, Vanetta Flowers to win gold in bobsled in 2002, and Gabby Douglas to win gold in gymnastics in 2012. Sarah Breedlove. Somebody knows this one. Sarah Breedlove. Documented in the Guinness Book of World Records as the first African-American female self-made millionaire, Madam C.J. Walker. <laughs> so C.J. is her husband, Charles J. Walker. So her professional name was Madam C.J. Walker. She made her money in hair care products in 1910. She lit the way for Sheila Johnson, the co-founder of BET, Beyonce, Serena Williams, and Oprah Winfrey, who just went and changed the M to a B and became a billionaire. <laughs> this one's my favorite, Charlotte Ray. Any guesses? I have so much candy, you guys are, you gotta try. Charlotte Ray, take a guess. <laughs> no, my favorite. An actress. Charlotte Ray was the first African American woman to earn a law degree in the United States. 
Any year? Anyone want to guess what year? Okay, 1962? 1920? The, the 20s? 1872. 18, y'all don't hear me, 1872, this woman earned her, uh, got a law degree. She was also the first woman admitted to the DC bar and the first woman admitted to practice before the Supreme Court of DC, what is now the district court, uh, US district court for the District of Columbia. Ultimately, she became a teacher because the prejudice against African-Americans and women made her law practice unsustainable. Important note, her father, 1872, ensured that all three of his daughters went to college. Charlotte Ray lit the way for countless women to practice law in the United States because her admission to the bar was used as precedent for women seeking bar admission in other states. Phyllis Wheatley. Poet and author, you get a piece of candy for that one. <laughs> Phyllis Wheatley was the first African-American woman to publish a book in 1770. Actually, I shouldn't even say African-American. Phyllis was African, having been, been brought to the United States by slave traders when she was seven years old. She was one of the best known poets in pre 19th century America. And she paved the way for the nation's first national youth po poet laureate, Amanda Gorman in 2017. I would like to share one of Amanda Gorman's poems with you because I think it highlights some of what we've been discussing. <clears throat> this is called At the Age of 18, Ode to Girls of Color. At the age of five, I saw how we always pick the flower swelling with the most color. The color distinguishes it from the rest and tells us this flower should not be left behind but this does not happen in the case of colored girls. Our color makes hands pull back and we left to grow alone, stretching our petals to a dry sun. At the age of 12, I blinked in the majesty of the color within myself, blinded by the knowledge that a skinny black girl, a young brown teen has the power to light Los Angeles all night, the radiance to heal all the scars left on this city's pavement. Why had this realization taken so long when color pulses in all that is beauty and painting and human? You see, long ago, they told me that snakes and spiders have spots and vibrant bodies if they are poisonous. In other words, being of color meant danger. Warning, do not touch. At the age of 18, I know my color is not warning, but a welcome. A girl of color is a lighthouse, an ultraviolet ray of power, potential, and promise. My color does not mean caution, it means courage. My dark does not mean danger, it means daring. My brown does not mean broken, it means bold backbone from working twice as hard to get half as far. Being a girl of color means I am key, path, and wonder all in one body. At the age of 18, I am experiencing how black and brown can glow. And glow I will, glow we will, vibrantly, colorfully, not as a warning, but as a promise that we will set the sky alight with our magic. One more test, Shirley Chisholm. She ran for president. Anything else? Shirley Chisholm was the first African-American woman elected to Congress in 1968, and also the first to seek the nomination for president for one of the two main political parties. Shirley lit the way for countless others and demonstrated what is possible for little black girls with a dream. One of those was Vice President Kamala Harris, whose mother told her, you may be the first to do many things, but make sure you aren't the last. So yes, let's celebrate Justice Katanji Brown Jackson as the first African-American woman to be appointed to the US Supreme Court. But let's not forget all the other black girls who have yet to make their mark. 
the ones full of promise and magic. As civil rights activist Ella Baker stated, give light and people will find the way. So give light. Educators, make your students aware of the world of opportunities open to all of them. Parents, encourage your daughters to dream and dream big. Sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, neighbors, friends, pastors, everybody. Recognize the hurdles standing between every black girl and her dreams and do what you can to mitigate them. While we celebrate Katanji being the first, let's all work together to make sure she's not the last. Thank you so much for your attention. So I think we will see if there's a question in first. Uh, so if you have any questions, I Sorry, people on YouTube, I'm still here. I had a question on of all the jobs you've had in the Army, which one did you enjoy the most? The reason I'm laughing um, so when I became a my first job in the army was legal assistance attorney, you know, do something where you can't hurt too many people when you're new. Right. So just somebody walks through the door with a legal problem. That's legal assistance. And then my boss asked me what I wanted to do next. And I said, I wanted to be a defense counsel. And he was very surprised, not trial counsel, you know, to which my response was, I just want to try cases. I'll do whatever you want me to do. But if I have a choice, I would like to be a defense counsel. One of the reasons, the reason I gave him was because I saw so many soldiers coming through that looked like me. And I thought at the worst moment in their lives, they need to have somebody that looks like them standing next to them. So at the time, being a defense counsel was my favorite job. And then later I got to be an appellate defense counsel. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is even better because I'm still doing the same work, but I don't actually have to be in the same room with them. <laughs> I could just read the record of trial and make the legal arguments and talk to them on the phone. So being an appellate defense counsel became my favorite job. Um, I was a deputy SJA or staff judge advocate. The, the staff judge advocate is the boss, the boss's lawyer. That's the general's lawyer. I was his deputy, which meant while he had to go talk to the general, I got to run the office and talk to all the captains. As you have surmised, I like to talk. So... <laughs> At the time, that was my favorite job. Uh, but at the end of the day, being a judge was my favorite job. It was hands down the hardest job I've ever done, ever. Because I think if you do it right, it should be. You are, you have somebody's life in your hands, um, especially in a judge alone trial. So uh, in the military, things may have changed since I retired, but. Um, uh, an accused has a right to a trial by panel or jury or a trial by judge alone. So when they're tried by judge alone, that means I am deciding guilty or not guilty. And I am deciding the sentence. That is a lot of power to put in one person's hand. And I took it very, very seriously. And I struggled <laughs> to make sure I was making the right decision. And um, this is personal to me. I don't know how anybody does it without faith in God, because I had to pray before and after every decision. Um, I definitely didn't want to do that by myself. You know, if I, if I felt that the correct sentence was sending somebody to prison for 10 years, that is a hard thing to do, to decide for somebody. And as a rule, I would look you in the eye when I gave the sentence, because if I can't look you in the eye when I'm doing it, then I have no business going. In. So I guess the short answer is it was my, my favorite job was the one I was doing at the time. <laughs> um, but I would not go back. I'm happily retired. Some, you had a question. Sounds like there's a great story. 
Can you tell us a story about your decision between USC and UCLA? Oh, <laughs> it was, you know, it's one of those things where, where you might not think you can do that much to help somebody and you'd be surprised what you can do. So for whatever reason, I think just because I had heard of UCLA, I wanted to go to UCLA. It also helped that it was in LA. I'm sort of a sun beach kind of person. So um, not wanting to put all my eggs in that basket, I applied to eight different schools, a couple in California. I thought, what if I don't get to California? So I applied to a couple in Texas because it's still hot. And then to make my mother happy, I applied to some in Maryland and DC where I did not want to be. Um, I got into all of them. <laughs> and of the eight schools that I applied to, seven gave me money. Only the one I wanted to go to did. <laughs> you know, I look back sometimes and I, you know, I think about the student loans that I paid off and I thought, how would my life have been different if I had just followed the money? <laughs> I could have gone to school for free, but I just had, you know, I really wanted to go to UCLA. And I, and I do think it was a good decision. But so, yes, University of Southern California was offering me a free ride. Um, I had called UCLA and I said, has there been a mistake? Simply everyone is giving me money. Why aren't you giving me money? And they're like, oh, you know, we're a public university, so we can't do what those private schools can do. And I said, well, University of Texas is public and they're giving me money. But um, she didn't have an answer to that one. Uh, <laughs> she just simply said, there's no money. And so I accepted USC. I told my father who was perplexed and said, you know, if this is what you want, it'll happen. Just, just go for it. The next day, a writing professor from UCLA School of Law, who was a UCLA, uh, UCLA law graduate um, and a black man called me. Uh, I found out later there were about a hundred roughly black students admitted to the School of Law every year. And he called them all. So he called me to say, hey, you've been admitted. I hope you're coming. And I said, actually, I'm not because there's no money. And he said, let me see what I can do. And the next day, that same woman from UCLA called me and said, I don't know how you know this man, but he really went to bat for you. And we can't do what USC can do, but we'll give you one year. And I said, all I need is one year. Um, I had never met this man before in my life. And he ended up, he wasn't even my writing instructor. He was never my professor. Um, I got there, you know, I took the one year. I got there, it was about a month into school. And uh, I went to, they were putting the Black Law Student Union, uh, Black Law Student Association together. And I went to a meeting and there was just this guy standing there in a suit and law students don't wear suits. And I figured this has to be him. And I looked at him and I said, Brian, and he said, Kirsten, and just gave me this huge hug because, because of that man, I went to UCLA. Now I hustled for the next two years to find money everywhere I could, but my father was right. If you really want it, you know, you'll find a way to do it. And with that one year, once I got there, you know, I became a California resident. So now I'm paying in-state tuition and I applied for every $20 Anybody giving away money, I apply for it and I made it work for the next two years. So that's the story. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. You know, being the first, how did other people that have been in the military handle that? You know, the establishment of the uh, army, the other white officer. You know, it, there wasn't a big hullabaloo or anything. Um, at, you would go to a military judge's course and you have to pass the course with a certain percentage in order to actually become a judge, you did that. And then we have a robing ceremony. And um, one of our, JAG Corps had five general officers at the time, one of those, um, was actually robing us. So you'd walk across the stage and he'd put your judge's robe on you. He had been my assignments officer years before. Um, so I knew him somewhat. And uh, as he put the robe on me, he whispered, you know, you're making history. Um, since that time, uh, the JAG Corps has a historian, uh, Frederick Bort, and he keeps track of all of this stuff. <laughs> 
I imagine 50 years from now, you know, it'll come out in a magazine or something. But um, for me, it was more of the looks on people's faces when I walked into the courtroom. And it could vary. But the ones that I remember were when, um, you know, the soldier, uh, there would be a black soldier who was the defendant and his family would be, you know, out in the audience and they'd call all rise and there was a little black girl would walk out. And, and you could just, you, you could just see, I, I remember this one case in particular because his sister and his mother and his grandmother were there and they're all, you know, standing waiting for the judge to come in. And I walk in and they went, oh. <laughs> And, and I think um, it's not that they went, oh, this is going to go our way. It was just, honestly, it was, oh, he's going to get a fair trial. And that's so sad, but it's true. It's just the fact that I was there that they thought he's going to get a fair shake. And it doesn't mean that he wasn't guilty or wasn't punished or anything else, but that they felt that it, he would actually be heard. And that's what I think is the importance of having representation everywhere, be it race, gender, any other kind of category you can come up with, that's the importance of representation, is making sure people feel like they're being heard. Yes, ma'am. So we have a lot of moms at home watching by YouTube because they have kids and jobs <laughs> and husbands and, and dogs. <laughs> they just couldn't make it. They wanted to, but, and you know that. So how did you survive all these years married with kids and deployments and career and school and volunteering, all of that, you yeah. know, um, as you were, you know, making your way through the military and, and, and to this historic moment, but you also had dinner to make, you had school projects. How did you <laughs> keep your sanity? Um, I used, I sometimes still say, but I used to say I was so tired, I retired. <laughs> uh, there was actually a point in my career where I looked back and I said, how did I do that? That was impossible. So um, we were really blessed to be stationed together a lot. Uh, we spent a lot of time at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where my husband is from and where his parents live. Uh, my children know their grandparents intimately, <laughs> having spent lots of time there. In fact, um, I fly them out here to babysit. <laughs> it's you know, that's, that's what you do. Um, it was hard. There's, there's no getting around it. It was hard and I was tired. And as women, we know that you just juggle all the balls, right? You just do. And I really do think women and men are made differently because not that y'all are less or anything, but in my experience, men are very good at focusing and women are very good at juggling all of the many things we have to do. So um, one of the times we were not stationed together, my husband was taking command at Fort Bragg and I got sent out to Fort Hood, Texas to be a judge. And, you know, my kids had been in North Carolina. They lived there. We had a house. They were in school. You know, their grandparents lived, what, 10 miles away. I could have left them there and been fine. By the way, my son was one. Um, <laughs> and I thought, uh, they're not going to be able to do all the things that they want to do. And so like a crazy person, I took them with me where they got to do all the things they wanted to do. And I was run ragged, but um, I, I would do it the same again. So um, Fort Hood, Texas, no real support system, three kids ages 14, 12, and two. He turned two while we were out there. My girls were heavily involved in local theater. They were in every show that the local theater did. And I was trying cases at Fort Polk, Louisiana, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. I don't remember how many babysitters I went through, um, but I would be at Fort Polk, Louisiana. You know, there's no highway from Fort Hood, Texas to Fort Polk, Louisiana. There's no highway. It's just country roads with cows and no cell phone signal. It, somebody really ought to look into that. So I... <laughs> I would finish a trial at Fort Polk at 10, 11 o'clock at night. And by all rights, I should get a hotel and stay the night. And I said, I'm simply going home to my children because I have some woman staying there with them who I hired and I vetted, but mm, I'm going home. <laughs> 
And so many a night I can remember driving these back roads and thinking, if I hit a cow, I don't even have a cell phone signal. <laughs> I'll just be here until the morning. Thankfully, I never hit a cow. But, um, but that's what you do, you know? And uh, the end of that is that our oldest daughter was in an acapella group in college and was many times the soloist. And our younger daughter uh, majored in theater at Emerson College and plans to go on to get her Master of Fine Arts in acting. So I was out in the parking lot with a stroller getting exercise while they were in there rehearsing for their plays. <laughs> um, yeah, so the answer is you're just very tired and you, and you, I'm sorry, I left out the most important part is you get help. Um, something I tell especially dual military couples. Usually the woman is asking me, how do I do all of this? Um, the same way I did. I asked somebody older, how do I do all of this? And uh, one of my mentors in the JAG Corps told me, uh, you know, as you get promoted, you'll make more money and then you'll get more help. <laughs> and it sounds you're like, really? Yes, really. And so uh, in my words, what I tell people is pay the man, whoever the man is, pay him. Is it the lawn man? Is it the repair man? Is it the pay, pay the man? Um, you have a choice between mowing the lawn on Saturday or spending time with your kids, pay the man. So money is money. It's going to come and go, but you have a limited amount of time to spend with your kids. And so, so we're tired <laughs> and we're just done and you have to do what you need to do to, to, you know, rejuvenate, but, um, you do it and then you look back and you go, there were simply not enough hours in a day. I don't know how I did that. I really don't. I look back when I, the year in Texas, I have no idea how I did it. it it's a blur. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. And um, I'm a retired English and history teacher, and I was in the military too, not your stature, but so I, I really admire you. But I, I have a question, um, it may be a little touchy. But um, I would think in, in 2022 that we've come further than we have now. And I watched the hearings for Katanje and I, the usual characters did their usual nasty stuff. And, and I would listen and read about, well, just because she's black doesn't mean she's qualified. And why is Biden appointing someone just because she's black? We need the most qualified person. And I'm like, I don't see how anyone could have been more qualified. <laughs> Is that right? I yeah, mean, raise your hand if you graduated from Harvard Magna Cum Laude. Right. Anyone? <laughs> right. I'm just like, and, and her sense of presence and self and her grace and elegance. So, I mean, you don't have to answer this, but did you face that in the army? Any of that? Well, who is she? I mean, or is she just have this job because yeah. she's not really the best, but they're just trying to make a statement. It, you know, I think, I think in the 21st century, most people are smart enough not to be overt with it. Not politicians, but most other people. <laughs> and so, you know, there would, there would be the subtle little things. Um, at the end of the day, just being better. Um, the reality is, as a Black woman, for me to be where I am, I had to be better. I couldn't be as good as, because that, that wouldn't have been enough. Um, also, I'm not a shrinking violet, so I tend to say things out loud. Um, and this is more of a woman thing, but when I was, a, I was a prosecutor at Fort Bragg, and of course, all the other prosecutors are male. I'm also the only black officer in the building. Um, and uh, I had a newborn. And a nanny, because you hire help. <laughs> and so I would leave, leave the office at six o'clock. No, 5.30. I would leave the office at 5.30 to be home by six o'clock. So PT started at 6.30 in the morning. It's 5.30, I'm going home. And uh, one evening I was packing up to leave. And one of the other trial counsel said kind of flippantly, oh, going home so soon? First of all, it is 5.30. Why are you still here? <laughs> but, um, and I said, yeah, you know, the little woman's got dinner ready. Oh, wait, that would be me. And no more comments were made after that. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes it's, it's 
sort of subtle things, but you know, everybody has their way as a woman. I'm sure you've dealt with it. You, you find ways to, to, uh, to get through it. Um, I will tell this story. Uh, as a captain on Fort Bragg, pregnant with our first child and my husband was in command and, you know, as the spouse, there is a volunteer role. And so I tried, <laughs> I tried to, I tried to do everything. It didn't always work, but so, uh, so there was a meeting after work, um, that as in my spouse capacity, I needed to be at. And so I'm in this maternity uniform, <laughs> this big smock and it's, you know, like June or July in Fayetteville, North Carolina is hot. And so we're in whatever building having the meeting and as pregnant women are wont to do, I have to go to the bathroom. And I say that and uh, whatever uh, soldier says, oh, we don't have a women's room in this building. <laughs> because it was the 82nd, they didn't have women in the 82nd back then. This is the nineties, there were no women. So there was no women's room. So I'm gonna have to go back to like the headquarters, uh, back to another building in order to use a bathroom. And I remember looking at my husband and saying, you know, I'm not coming back, right? <laughs> so that's just to set the stage. So with all of that going on, I am walking across the 82nd division area to get to this other building, to go to the bathroom. And a young white male 82nd Airborne Division soldier is approaching me on the sidewalk. Now, I think that there are two versions of really who are soldiers. There's that soldier who's just sharp. He's got his uniform together. He knows everything. He looks good. He renders a crisp salute. Ma'am, yes, ma'am. And then there's the other one who is, you know, uniform looks good. He's strong. He maxes his PT test and he is just the best thing out there and you need to recognize it. And he's not going to salute no girl. Mm, I think he was that one. <laughs> So I'm in a mood because <laughs> it's hot and I have to go to the bathroom <laughs> and I'm walking across Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And he's, he's coming right at me on the sidewalk and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I've got my, it's the rank is right there. It's very shiny. And I wait and I wait and I watch as he just walks right by me. I watch him and I <laughs> uh, so I turned around, I, I, he was a, he was a private and I said, private, stops and looks. And honestly, this is what I think goes on because it still goes on. It's not that I, I really don't think it's that they are consciously choosing not to recognize you. I think he saw a black girl. So the captain didn't register because it didn't match. So you see what you expect to see. And he didn't expect to see a pregnant black female officer in the 82nd Airborne Division area. Unfortunately for him, that's what I was. So I said, private. And he turns around and I said, I just wanna know which one you're not saluting. Is it the black, the woman, or the pregnant? And he just said, ma'am, ma'am. Ma'am, and I just said, pay attention. <laughs> so that was unfortunate, but I was in a mood. But it really, it's it's just they don't, they don't see you. They just don't see you. That's what I that's what I choose to believe instead of you see me and you're just ignoring me. Because it could be that. But I, I really do think it's that it doesn't register. You know, if you're walking down the street and you see an elephant in a tutu, your mind is not gonna accept it. <laughs> <laughs> and I just think, sadly, some people's minds don't accept Black women in certain positions or women in certain positions. So. so I'm kind of an educator as well. I work in a predominantly white community, white school, white staff, definitely becoming more diverse we really work hard with allyship and advocacy. What is your advice for us given those demographics? How can we be the best advocates and the best allies for our students of color, particularly girls, but all students of color? Uh, 
That's a, that's a tough one. Um, I think first off is, is what some people do with good intentions is to say, I don't see color. You know, my daughter's response to that is you can't see me standing right here. Okay. So don't pretend that there are not differences because there are. Okay. And not seeing someone in how they truly are means you don't see them. Um, and, and especially for young girls, you know, so that's step one is don't pretend that there aren't differences. Don't, they know they're different. <laughs> Every time they walk into your school, they feel that they are different. Um, so I think acknowledging the difference, but that it, but that you're not different, like, okay, your skin's a different color or your clothes are different, but we're the same. Um, Sometimes I think that's just not said out loud. And so kids are left to either figure it out themselves or pick it up from others. And so if we all pretend that nothing's going on, you don't see anything, then we can pretend that there isn't an issue. Okay. So I think, um, you know, with the events of the last few years, um, a lot of white people were very surprised you know, to hear about police brutality and to hear about the killings. And, you know, we're like, yeah, it's Tuesday. What are your questions? You know? And so people were like, this has been going on right under our noses. How did we not know? And it's because everything's fine. We don't see anything. Right. So if we recognize and embrace the differences and celebrate diversity, because what is there not to celebrate? Why would we all want to be the same? That's boring. Can you imagine just eating vanilla ice cream? all the time, no sherbet, come on, no chocolate, no whatever weird other flavors there are, I don't know. <laughs> but, but just, just if, it's, if it's a part of the normal, it's just the rhythm of the, of the day, you know? It's not, it's February, let's talk about black people. It's March, let's talk about women. Why, why is it relegated to a month? Why aren't we talking about people all year long? And so if, um, I don't know if it's the, uh, I imagine it's the school district and not a particular school, but uh, my son's in Clover Park School District. And I tell you, since from fifth grade on up, I am always amazed by the books that he is reading. They're always by a very diverse group of, so you probably are the same, very diverse group of authors. And the fact that they're reading these books in school and then discussing them in school, that means it's, I don't even know if they're saying, you know, this author is Muslim. No, it's just the fact that she is. And you don't even have to point it out. It's just that you're exposing these kids to all of this stuff. So I think one way, I won't say the best way, because <laughs> how do I know? But, but one way to make it easier is to make it normal, because it is. It's normal that you recognize that you're one of only a few. We all recognize it, too. So we don't have to pretend that we don't see it. Um, so let's talk about it. I, I just, I, I'm a very direct person and I just tend to believe everything is better if it's out in the open. Let's just talk about it. So that's my two cents. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, this is not a, a question, but it's a, a sh short story to, make you feel not alone. I know you kn know you're not alone, but it was very similar to your story about um, when you uh, were frustrated when they, um, the private didn't salute you. Um, some years ago, like my, my dad was in the army, for, mm -hmm. he was an army chaplain for 20 years. And um, I remember when I was walking with him, um, I think we were around a PX and, you know, um, environment or something like that. And I saw from a distance there was, um, uh, a, a black soldier, I think she was a black officer, yelling at um, like two white, um, probably um, enlisted um, uh, soldiers. And then she was, she was saying, you don't salute officers. And so the way I was interpreting it, because I think I just navigate in a way like um, where I don't really like to see titles and, and, and let that you know, get so wrapped up in my mind. So I thought she was coming from that perspective of possibly arrogance mm. 
And so, I, so I was telling my dad, like, oh, it's, you know, it's not a, you know, like I felt like I wouldn't probably, you know, I would have let it go. But with him and his experience, he was saying, no, no, that happens very often. She's mm-hmm. probably coming from a, yeah. So he was, so I was, I, when you told that story, I was like, I saw it. Yeah. And this is the experience. So, and as I'm older, you know, in adulthood, I'm now, ex- I'm experiencing that more. My, mm. And so, well, I don't want to say experiencing that I was, um, well, I am, <laughs> but I was given the heads up by experiences of my friends in the professional world. And then now I, um, you always have to be prepared in many ways. Um, you, but at the same time, when it ex- you experience it, you're not surprised. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, I just, you're not alone with that. I know, you know, but it's a thing. So. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Kirsten. So I'm kind of floating around a question. I'm not really sure what the question is, Okay. but you shared with some of us once that you had an interesting elementary school experience. Mm-hmm. I don't want to give it away, but you, you were bused to a different school wasn't your choice. Mm -hmm. Surely that had a variety of impacts on you. Lessons learned that maybe as an adult now, um, you can think how it would benefit educators to know what that new situation was like. Hmm. Would you be willing to speak at all? Yeah, sure. So um, I mentioned I went to a predominantly Black elementary school. Um, I don't know where at the time I know it was called nursery school, which I guess was daycare. Um, but in my head, it was nursery school. And it must have been a phenomenal place because they would let me read. Again, mother was an English teacher. So I was, I was reading in nursery school. Um, and I got to kindergarten and I hated it. And I can remember telling my mother that I wanted to go back to nursery school because they didn't even know their letters. <laughs> And all they did was say the alphabet and then go outside to play, take a nap and go home. And this was dumb. Um, So they put me in first grade. Uh, And in first grade, there were two white boys in my class. All the teachers were white, except for the gym teacher. There were two white boys in my class. I remember that. Um, And I don't remember a lot of the elementary school. I do remember a PE class. The PE teacher was black and we went out to a black top with a fence around it, a big high fence. And we marched. And I thought this is the, I'm, you know, I'm six. I thought this is the dumbest thing. Why are we doing this? But that was our PE class. So um, when we got bust to me as a, seven-year-old then, it meant I had to get up earlier. (laughs) You know, and then I had to, I mean, we caught a bus anyway, but the school was, you know, five miles away. I was now taking a bus. I was on the bus for half an hour in the mornings to ride down to a completely different neighborhood. And okay, I have to tell you about my first day of school. It was in the second semester of second grade. So it was January. And um, I got there, my teacher, Mrs. List, I just, I love teachers. So the fact that I remember my teachers, you, you know. <laughs> so my teacher, Mrs. List were there, was there and she introduced me to Therese Frisbee and said, she will show you around and show you everything. And then Mrs. List walked away and Terry Frisbee and I are standing there staring at each other. And then this little blonde haired blue eyed little boy just pops up and says, hi, I'm Greg. You can have a cubby next to mine. And then we went to school together for the next 10 years. So Greg's parents had told him, well, my father had sat me down and said, okay, you're going to be bused to school. There's going to be a lot of people that don't look like you. They are no better than you. You just remember that nobody there is better than you. Greg's parents sat him down and said, there are going to be some new kids coming to your school. It is your job to make them feel welcome. And that's what he did. He bounced up to me and said, took me away from the teacher appointed guide, (laughs) gave me a cubby next to his. And I kid you not, we went to school together for the next 10 years and we are friends to this day. We have so much in common. It's It's like me and Katanji. It's a weird backwards thing. His family's four boys, mine's four girls. Um, But uh, arriving and leaving school, arriving at and leaving, 
it was just a bus full of black kids, right? That would come in. Now there were a couple of black families in the neighborhood. So this was not completely new to them. Um, but there was a distinction between the kids that rode the bus and the, the couple that lived in the neighborhood. They were, they were okay, they lived here, but we were bused in. Then even on the bus, I'm sort of ashamed to say this, even on the bus, there was a separation because my neighborhood, well, we lived in townhouses. I don't know if y'all have the same definition. They're just connected. So we lived in townhouses and we had a playground. Well, our bus first stopped in the housing project, which was called Central Gardens. And they picked up the kids from there and we called them the Central Gardeners because that's what kids do. And so there was a distinction between the Central Gardeners and us. And it's so, it just, it breaks my heart to think of it right now, but there was already this, well, you're, you're one of the bust kids. You're not one of the ones that lives here. Yeah, but, but I'm not a central gardener, you know? Um, so that's what I want you to work against is those kinds of separations. Just celebrate everything that's different about everybody. Um, um, another one is that because Education was important, you know. I got, I got skipped a grade. I was smart, um, which, to some black people, means you're white. Figure that one out. So, if you don't talk a certain way, and if all the other kids in your class are white, you are either trying to be white, or something to that effect. So. There are so many, humans make so many divisions and distinctions that, um, and I know there's already enough pressure on our educators, <laughs> but that's where they, that's where our kids are all day. That's just where they, that's where their socialization takes place. That's where they are. So the more that we can normalize this stuff in schools, then the better equipped our kids are to take that out with them in life um, and, and hopefully stop making the, the stupid distinctions. Um, I don't know. I mean, we can go into the whole history of this country about where some of this stuff comes from, but the, you know, being uppity and, and putting on airs and all those kinds of things, which then when you take it to my community and you reverse it, it's, well, why are you trying to be like that instead of being here with us? So, uh, yeah, success does not mean you're trying to be anything other than you are just the best version of yourself. And I wish we could get everybody to understand that. So that's another thought when we're talking about, you know, those young girls who may not have even considered college, you know, maybe that's something they're working with that nobody in their neighborhood goes to college. And that's not, that's not what they're supposed to do. So um, just like I had no idea what an Ivy League school was, maybe they have no idea that, that they could even go to college, that, that black girls go to college, you know, or, or that native people go to college. Maybe they don't think about it that way. And so, so, you know, we, the collective, we have to do a better job of instilling that in them. Just be the best version of yourself. So I hope I, I don't know if I should, I don't remember what I told you, Laura. So <laughs> maybe it was in there somewhere. <laughs> Seven o'clock. It but is I, seven o'clock. And I'm just going to make a couple of reflections and let you take us out. Um, the first is um, that story uh, on the busing circled back to what parents say matters and what dads say matter, which was part of what we had talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, when we had started talking about having this talk and we were talking about first, and it hadn't occurred to me that being a first has to have a certain amount of loneliness to it as you're an only all the time. Uh, and so, um, I started thinking about that for many, many people, uh, just from you and I talking about, and, and so I don't know if you experience that, but that has to be a component and you have to be resilient, um, to be able to handle that. Um, and so I want to thank you for sharing with us this evening. And if you have any fi final thoughts, cause I don't want you to be late picking up. Yes. So yes, I did. I told Bridget I had a hard stop at seven because um, I'm not completely retired. I still have a kid. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
he is in Lacey and he would like to be here. So I have to go pick him up. Um, I completely forgot what I was going to say now. Um, you said, what was the last thing you said? Yes, that one. So um, yes, and this, this kind of ties into what you were saying when you only have a couple that uh, might be of a different ethnicity, different race or something. It is, uh, one is, is, it's the idea that you are now the spokesperson for everybody, whether you want to be or not, you know, that people come to you as the, the authority on all of this. That's one position. The other is that um, you can see things in a different way. That's why we have diversity, right? Because you can see things that maybe other people wouldn't see. Um, without going on too long, I remember I had a case, it was just about spanking, and this soldier was being court-martialed, and he talked about, um, his cousin came in and testified about, about the two of them going down to grandma's house in Georgia every summer, and when they got in trouble, grandma would pull out the belt, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh, you got a belt? Because my grandma had a switch. <laughs> And so, I mean, it was just, it was just child abuse and that is horrible. And I'm sitting here, you know, with my judge face very, mm, and I'm going, that seems mild. <laughs> so his grandmother from Georgia, yeah, that's normal. Um, and you know, you still filter it all through the law, but just, I think in that case, because, because of how I grew up, because of who my grandmother was, I was able to bring a different perspective that, that you know, somebody from Vermont maybe would not have had. So that's just, that's the beauty of having diversity is being able to have all these different points of view and and that, that's what we should aspire to, right? So, okay, on that note, um, I do have to pick up my child. So thank you all so much for coming. <laughs> I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. <laughs>